Lebanon is spiraling towards collapse. More than half the people in this small Mediterranean country live below the poverty line. Basic foodstuffs have increased in price. There are queues for fuel. No electricity for 20 hours a day. Medicines are running low. Hospitals are struggling to function. And crime is rising. The currency is worth 90% less than it was two years ago. This means most people's salaries have decreased in value, while at the same time, the prices of nearly everything have skyrocketed. Lebanese shoulder the burden of these crises largely alone, with little support from the state. For nearly a year, there's been no government to implement the economic reforms needed to lift the country out of crisis. Many analysts argue the economic collapse, the long-running political stalemate and the devastating explosion at Beirut port all have the same root cause. A sectarian-based political system that has allowed for years of mismanagement and corruption by the same people who are in power now. Lina Merjanian has survived the Lebanese civil war two occupations, Israeli offensives, and an era of political assassinations. But she says this is the most difficult period she's lived through, a sentiment echoed by many others. During civil war, there was money. Uh, there was work, people used to work, people used to be able uh, to provide for themselves. Uh, now we cannot. We don't have work, we don't have money. Uh, we cannot provide for ourselves. Uh, we don't know where we are going, uh, there's no government, there's no rules. The money that we had in the banks, a little bit of money that we had saved for our, uh, you know, uh, when we re retire, uh, vanished. We don't have anything, we lost, uh, we lost everything. After working at the American University of Beirut Medical Center for 15 years, in 2020, Lena was one of about 800 employees who were made redundant. The hospital, one of the best in the country, was cutting back as Lebanon hurtled towards economic collapse. Suddenly, uh, my uh, department manager called me and gave me an envelope uh, telling me that uh, they have decided to lay me off and, uh, uh, and that's it. And they, they didn't ask if I need anything. You know, it was a very hard time. I walked like a... I was shocked. But things were about to get worse. Two weeks later, on August the 4th, Lena's house was destroyed in the enormous explosion that rocked Beirut. Luckily, she wasn't home at the time. As one of the walls collapsed, her windows shattered and her doors were blown off their hinges. Lena's neighborhood is close to the port and the warehouse where thousands of tons of a hazardous chemical compound had been stored for six years. We were frightened and then we heard a, a, an airplane uh, uh, flying over us very fast and then there was the explosion, the big explosion. We thought the, the center was exploded. With assistance from charities, not the government, Lena was able to rebuild her house. Now, her life savings are disappearing quickly. They are dramatically reduced thanks to the 90% devaluation of the Lebanese currency, combined with hyperinflation. Although she's in her 60s, Lena has no choice but to look for work. She's one of millions of Lebanese who are unemployed. And with such stiff competition in a dwindling job market, she asks, who will employ an elderly woman? Not far away lives Randa Nima Abu Daha. Her house was also badly damaged in the explosion. Like Lena and the vast majority of affected families, she too relied on charities, unable to afford the repairs herself. Uh, 
Randa is on antidepressants, but it's not easy to find the pills she's been prescribed. Medicines are state subsidized, but as the country's dollar reserves are dwindling, the government hasn't been paying suppliers. Some drugs are stuck at Beirut's port, others are rationed by suppliers. Unsure when they'll be paid, pharmaceutical companies don't know whether to sell their stock at the subsidized price or the market value. In recent years, the government has also been subsidizing fuel. But after months of unpaid accounts, energy companies are rationing fuel, leading to long queues. In some instances, the desperation is so great that people have been killed in gun and knife fights. Most of the time, though, the family can't afford to fill up. Their household income is so low that they're forced to rely on food parcels from an aid organization. Randa says her weekly food budget used to be £100,000, or $66. She According to the Crisis Observatory at the American University of Beirut, food prices have risen 700% in two years. So families need to spend five times the minimum wage to survive. Something far beyond the reach of many people. The UN estimates at least 1.5 million Lebanese need aid. Randa's son has dropped out of college to work with his father to boost the family income. Although he's not a child, UNICEF says one in every 10 children in Lebanon are likely working, and 15% of families have had to take their children out of school. But why is Lebanon's currency in free fall? And where did all the dollars go? After the end of the civil war in the 1990, um, Lebanon's economic development was based on the financial sector. So what we, what we saw is the over-financialization of the Lebanese economy. To give you an example, uh, uh, the, the, the budget of the, uh, of the Ministry of Agriculture is 1% of the total uh, annual budget in Lebanon. Although the fertile Becca Valley offers the potential for a strong agriculture sector, Lebanon imports most of its food, and almost everything else as well. Instead of production and trade, the country has relied on funds from abroad for decades. In the 1990s, then Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri began taking on loans in dollars, money that would become public debt. There is no real economy, uh, and, and, and so when we say Ponzi scheme is that the whole economy was, was, was basically fueling consumption through the deposits of either um, Lebanese diaspora or uh, 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 money coming from Europe, from the Gulf, that could invest in Lebanon for high returns on, on investment, but, but this high return was based literally on a, on a bubble, which was the public debt. Uh, and so, of course, now it came to an end, it's like the credit card. Is, is finished. And that price is Lebanon's current public debt of at least $90 billion. Compounding the problem was the vast sums of money disappearing to corruption. And the banks were in on the scheme. By saying that the banks are bankrupt or insolvent, the, the, the law has to kick in, which means that the central bank has to buy the banks and restructure the whole banking sector uh, and, and recapitalize it through an IMF loan. Instead, what is what's, what's happening is, is, a, is a literally another, another Ponzi scheme, a reverse Ponzi scheme, whereby the depositors lose their money if they would like to take it out of the bank. New banking policies mean dollars deposited before 2019 can only be withdrawn under severe restrictions or as Lebanese pounds. So people's savings are effectively lost. But this wasn't the case for all Lebanese. In late 2019, three to four billion dollars was sent abroad. The wealthy managed to get their money out of the banks before the restrictions set in, saving themselves from the same fate of the low and middle income earners. The artificial peg of 1,500 pounds to the dollar that was created by the Bank of Lebanon in 1997 and maintained the bubble could no longer be sustained. 
as the foreign currency had stopped flowing in. For years, Lebanon's middle class benefited as the peg ensured they were paid internationally competitive salaries and allowed for a higher standard of living. But now those times are over. At Abdullah Qasim's private practice, the fluctuations in currency mean the cost of dental procedures fluctuates too. From the time someone books an appointment to the time they come in for a treatment, the cost that Abdullah needs to pay in Lebanese pounds may have increased leaving him to cover the shortfall and potentially not able to restock. Laboratories and suppliers face the same problem. For the past two years and a half, probably, we haven't made really profit and we're just in a surviving uh, mode. Um, it's a huge responsibility as a job itself and today more than ever, I believe. And there is no room to think of the future in this situation. We're just trying to cope with present and uh, try to just survive and continue in what we're doing. A bigger challenge is paying for the diesel guzzling generators needed to keep the lights on, even for a dentistry. Few people here enjoy the luxury of electricity for 24 hours a day, not only because the machines aren't designed to operate for extended periods, but also because there's a fuel shortage. Business owners like Abdullah pay for multiple generators just to keep their doors open. One critical sector that's suffering is medical care. Hospitals are struggling as they are run largely as private businesses. Nowadays, there are shortages of medical supplies from the basics, like thread for stitches and needles, to dialysis machines. Salaries have gone from thousands of dollars a month to a few hundred, and yet doctors and nurses risk their lives daily battling a rising number of coronavirus patients. When Beirut port went up in flames, at least 6,000 people were injured and more than 200 died. The exact number isn't even known. Many doctors were on the front line and the already beleaguered healthcare system was pushed to the absolute limit. I remember every day some of my patients was lying on the desk beside the printer and full of blood. And uh, that picture is hard to get out of my mind. Medical staff were among those whose homes were destroyed. They too lost friends and family members in the blast and their homes were damaged. Yet hundreds of them came directly to the hospitals and worked for days with barely any sleep. The flood of patients combined with a shortage of supplies meant doctors were forced to perform procedures with no anaesthetic. I think uh, that uh, stitching a patient without uh, analgesia, uh, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't only harm the patient on the pain level, uh, but also it harms uh, the doctor uh, who is uh, uh, having a problem uh, about uh, the, yeah, the rush uh, to do things uh, and uh, to uh, uh, give the uh, highest uh, speed uh, care uh, on the standards of care. Frustrated by the decline of standards in his profession and poor living conditions, Hussein, like hundreds of other healthcare workers, is looking to leave the country. The blast was caused by around 2,750 tonnes of ammonium nitrate, a compound used in agriculture and mining, that had been sitting idle for six years. It was the largest non-nuclear explosion in human history. It's still not clear why the shipment was stored at the port for so long, or at whose request. Or why no order was issued to evacuate members of the public from the port and surrounding neighbourhoods when the fire broke out. But what is clear is that from the customs officer to the director of the port, from politicians to senior ministers, and all the way up to the presidency, they knew it was there and did nothing to remove it. A year has passed, but the investigation into the cause of the explosion has made little progress. After six months, the first judge appointed to lead the inquiry was removed after he summoned ministers to testify. His replacement is facing resistance from politicians who say they're protected by immunity laws. In Lebanon, you cannot uh, prosecute any public servant if the superior does not uh, give the approval for that for any crime, for any crime related to uh, 
the, the servants, of course. Um, the same for deputies and ministers. Um, the parliament should approve uh, the prosecution of deputies during the sessions. And the session now is permanent because we don't have a government. Politicians also use sectarian divides within society to accuse the judiciary of being biased. Always in Lebanon, every time you prosecute any uh, influent person, they come with the same discourse, you are targeting us. And suddenly the accused person became a victim. The lack of accountability in the Beirut port explosion is far from an exception. The judiciary reflects the political system, which is rife with corruption and cronyism. In Lebanon, senior prosecutors and members of the Higher Judicial Council are chosen by politicians. Those with the right connections escape justice, while those who don't have friends in high places are powerless. It's created a system that's unable to enforce safety checks and balances, and has allowed for what is described by analysts as state-sponsored mafias. Actually, after uh, uh, the civil war, we were living in a total hegemony of this charismatic state. This state governed by six sectarian leaders, which were able to do uh, uh, lots of illegal things and we, uh, without having any possibility to prosecute them. They are so powerful that it's, it's unconceivable to prosecute them. It's like if you have uh, a lion or something, uh, <laughs> I mean a big lion, and you are a system with uh, rabbits. I mean, it's, it's impossible. The tariff agreement that ended Lebanon's civil war in 1990 built on the power sharing system for the country's 18 sects, created post-French occupation. The plan aimed to keep the peace after 15 years of war. The sects maintained the same roles as before. The president is Christian, the prime minister Sunni, and the speaker of the house is Shia. But under the Taif agreement, the prime minister's powers were increased, and there are quotas for the number of seats in parliament held by each sect. But the sectarian nature of the system has led to dysfunctionality. In fact, the, the system uh, is a clientelist one. It, the current system cannot lead to any other re result. You have sectarian brokers who claim to represent their own sect and uh, uh, whose interest is to maximize short-term benefits and short-term rents and resources from the state uh, to keep apart from, for them, of course, and their parties, and to distribute a bit to their sect. So rather than acting in the interests of the state as a whole, political leaders prioritize people of their own sect and constituency. Often, this means overlooking long-term developments. More than three decades after the end of the civil war, Lebanon still doesn't have a reliable power supply. Outages last up to 20 hours a day. Lebanon's rolling blackouts are substituted with what's known as the generator mafia operators who often have ties to the politicians in their neighbourhood and so have a vested interest in supporting them. Meanwhile, the national grid is woefully inadequate to power Lebanon's 1.3 million homes and in desperate need of an overhaul, despite costing the government a total of $40 billion in debt over the past 30 years. Some of the funds allocated to upgrading the national grid have been spent on short-term solutions such as multiple floating power plants. But some of the money is unaccounted for. The President's Party, the Free Patriotic Movement, or FPM, has controlled the Ministry of Energy and Water for more than a decade. Plans were reportedly drawn up to completely overhaul the electricity sector, but they have never materialised. FPM tried to implement some, put in place some plans to implement some, uh, this plan, and actually the uh, political uh, struggles and, you know, uh, system uh, blocked it and then we failed to implement it. And definitely, I mean, it's, it's a political failure, actually. The power sharing system means that opposing parties can, and do, block each other's policies. 
It also means that forming a unity government is notoriously hard and it takes months to find a lineup that suits everyone. In the wake of the port disaster in August 2020, the government resigned. And for a year, during arguably the worst period of Lebanon's history, the country has limped on without a government. Unfortunately, the, the decision makers couldn't understand that the priority now is economical and is financial. And it's not time for the political quarrels and, you know, disputes, etc. And unfortunately, they failed to understand that this should be an extreme uh, priority. So who's to blame? Everyone is to blame. Uh, uh, the financial sector, Riyad Salemi, and the bankers uh, of the town who didn't see it coming, who denied it till the last day and kept on sucking people's savings to put them in a non-productive system. The politicians who did nothing to prevent corruption and who fueled a system that is based on clientelism to safeguard their own power. And Hezbollah and the Iranian influence and the, uh, this whole uh, axis uh, in the region who aggravated the case of Lebanon by cutting the ties with Europe and trying to cut with the Western world and the Arab world and taking us towards a resistance uh, economy that cannot work in Lebanon. The sectarian system is highly susceptible to outside influence as it resides in a region influenced by two major powers. At the same time, political groups have looked to take advantage of outside political, financial and in some cases, military backing. You cannot build a sustainable economy, a solid economy, while having a militia uh, that is infiodated to Iran, uh, uh, that is uh, uh, running or, or mastering or having the upper hand on very important decisions like the act of war and peace and the whole foreign relation and who to insult uh, outside the country and who to make peace uh, with. So, of course, Hezbollah is very detrimental to the, also the business climate in, in Lebanon. Who wants to invest in a country where you have Hezbollah running the port? Arguably, though, a nation state should have a legal framework, functioning judiciary and democratic structure that does not permit such high levels of outside interference. Foreign interventions and foreign interests have always caused us uh, big problems in Lebanon. But that's what foreign players do. They, they, they just try to uh, engage in politics to serve their own interests, definitely. The system was set to fail. The real blame is the confessional system as a whole. They all are, were part of the uh, decision-making process in Lebanon. No one was outside of government during the at least 15 years. So the debt, the role of the Lebanese debt, the state-owned debt I'm talking about, was to just spend on all of these confessions to remain in this power-sharing governments. However, will the upcoming elections in May 2020 instigate change? I don't know any political system that was fixed through elections, but it would be a stepping stone, uh, trying to uh, know what is the political, popular status of the political players in Lebanon, the uh, traditional political parties in Lebanon. It's the traditional political parties that will try to manage the election through the interior ministry, and political uh, financialization of the elections is quite easy. There are means to try to manipulate the results of the election. There are fears that the dramatic increase in poverty is pushing voters back towards the sectarian parties that have offered them safety nets for years, at the cost of nationwide development. Fed up with a system that was failing its people, in October 2019, protests erupted across Lebanon. The final straw was the threat of a WhatsApp tax, but the economic crisis was already weighing heavily on the country with rising unemployment and flailing public services. And when it was apparent the dollars were gone, the cries became louder for all the political leaders to step down. It was the first time in Lebanon's history that there were united protests beyond sectarian divisions, calling for a systemic change. But why did the demonstrations fizzle out?
ثاني اسلوب خلت الناس تطلع من الشارع ولا العنف المفرط اللي كان عم بتمارسه السلطه تجاه الشعب، ثانية الكوفيد 19 وانتشاره بلبنان، ثالثا هو عدم اقتناع الناس بالتغيير من حيث الشارع. عملية التغيير هي بدها شوي بقت بدها شوية وقت بلبنان وحتستمر لانتخابات نيابية تنكون قدرنا نعمل تغيير وفرق. Khaldun Jabba was part of those protests in 2019. He was arrested and beaten by security forces. Now he works at an online media outlet that was born during what the Lebanese refer to as the revolution. There are few independent mainstream media organizations. Most TV channels and newspapers are associated with political parties. Over the past few years, non-sectarian online platforms have been born and non-sectarian parties have been mobilizing hoping that at the next election, people will vote beyond the parties they have chosen for decades. But even lawmakers agree, as it is, the current political system doesn't represent true democracy. So until the system is changed, it's unlikely Lebanon will see the change it needs.